let's move on to the next panel b b before lunch on recovering money, quantum issues in construction disputes, obviously very <laughs> important fundamental, uh, rather fundamental topic. I I'm very pleased to uh, introduce as chair of, of the panel the Right Honorable Lord Justice Colson. Um, Mm, certainly, we would all agree the most senior uh, English judge who specializes, among other things, in construction law. Uh, he is known, of course, to all our students because his book on adjudication is really the beginning and, and the end of the knowledge um, on, that, uh, on that particular subject. Uh, Lord Justice Colson was called to the bar at Gray's Inn in 1982, uh, was appointed at the time Queen's Council in 2001, and uh, then uh, had a very distinguished um, uh, judicial career. He was appointed a recorder in the same year, then uh, uh, a senior circuit judge sitting in the Technology and Construction Court in 2004, then a judge of the High Court, Queen's Bench Divis Division in January 2008, um, and then uh, to the Technology and Construction Court where he was the judge in charge of the court for a number of years before being elevated to, um, to the Court of Appeal. So, Sir Peter, thank you very much for, for chairing this panel, being with us today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I bumped into a former colleague in QT Chambers this morning, very much like I lead in the press on... Um, um, Can't hear. Is that better? So to the IBAB team, please, the, the microphones appear to have been uh, switched off. Sorry. <laughs> this clearly works. I'm waiting for a blast of feedback. Are, there we are. They are now working. Good afternoon, thank you very much for having me. Uh, I was saying that this morning I bumped into a former colleague in Keating Chambers uh, in the coffee queue at the Pret-a-Manger opposite the Royal Courts of Justice and I told him what I was doing later today and he said, oh, what are the topics? And I said, well, there are various aspects of quantum. And he said, you're so senior, surely you should have got your junior to do quantum. <laughs> in fact, I, th I think a number of the points are, are very interesting and a bit like uh, slightly earlier when Fiona was answering a question and dealing with um, the various periods of litigation, I was at the back making a note because I thought, oh, that's interesting, I didn't know that. Um, so I'm hoping that for the rest of this session there will be plenty of opportunity for you to think, oh, that's interesting, I didn't know that. Um, I'm sure that I will um, learn a lot and I hope you will too. So um, what I shall do is I shall introduce each speaker as they come to, to talk to us. So um, we'll start with Frederick Wilmot Smith, who's going to talk about quantum merit claims following uh, an employer's wrongful termination, one of the most uh, common areas of debate and dispute. Um, Frederick Wilmot Smith was uh, an extremely well-known legal academic, having been a fellow of all souls. Um, he was then an academic at Oxford uh, and uh, I know from his CV that various papers of his have been cited uh, with approval in the, in the Supreme Court. I say with approval because plenty of my judgments get cited in the Supreme Court but approval is rarer. Uh, um, uh, he is also a barrister at Brick Court uh, and uh, we were talking just a moment ago, uh, and I'm bound to say I'm one of those people that believe that um, a legal academic is much better for having actually had to stand up and address a judge. Uh, there are one or two academics who I won't name who've never done that, and boy, can you tell. So, ladies and gentlemen, Frederick Wilmot Smith. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming uh, and for staying. I was asked to speak on quantum merit claims, and my initial thought, uh, as I'm not really a, primarily a construction lawyer, so this is not language that I tend to use. Construction what? 
quantum merit, there, there are two things that English lawyers in particular tend to do, I think, as a way of kind of confusing people who are learning the law or maybe confusing themselves. One is they will refer to something by reference to a case name. Say, ah, oh, that's the rule in Rylands and Fletcher. Or that's a Walsh and Lonsdale trust. And so, what does that mean? So Peter, I encourage you, if, if any advocate says that to you, ask them to explain, what do you mean? What does that mean? The other thing they do is they refer to things in Latin. And quantum merit is a good example, I think, of something where Latin is used to hide a range of different ideas that are helpfully unpicked. So I'm going to try to do that today, or at least as I understand them. Quantum merit, as you probably all know, began as a form of action and had fallen into disuse even by the time that the forms of action were abolished in the 19th century. Uh, it, was it was itself a species of a sunset, but it was then stopped being used because people instead used in debitatis a sunset. It was a more useful form of action. Now, as I say on the handout, the PowerPoint, it's helpfully compared and contrasted, I think, with another form of action money hadn't received. They're, in a sense, inverse of one another. Quantum merit is, it just means for what it's worth. The claim was, I have performed a service for you. Pay up. Pay the reasonable fee. The flip side of that is, I've paid you money, and you have failed to deliver goods or to perform a service. Give me back the money. First of those is quantum merit. The second of those was money hadn't received to the plaintiff's use. Hopefully you'll see why I bring up those two, because I think it's helpful to think of them in contradistinction to one another. The usual analysis is that there are two types of quantum merit claim, a contractual one and a non-contractual one. The contractual claim, well, one of the questions will be, what is the distinction between those two? But the contractual one is often associated as originating or as being understood as clearly expressed in the Six Carpenters case, which is a 17th century, early 17th century case. If one bid me to do work for him and do not promise anything for it, in this case, the law supplieth the promise, the promise to pay. Now, one way of thinking of the difference between contractual and non-contractual cases is what you understand the law to be doing in that sentence. The usual way of understanding contractual claims is there is an agreement that there will be money paid or for some service, and the law is supplying the value in the party's contract. So you have a contract, and the law is just kind of gap-filling, adding a little bit to it. The non-contractual, the thought is that there is no agreement, uh, or enforceable agreement maybe, to pay for the work. And so the law is doing a bit more. It's getting off the ground not only the, the quantum, but also the fact that it has to be paid for. One example of that that people debate the proper understanding of is Planchet and Colbert, which is the example I give you. So that's a little bit of background to how these things are understood. I think that probably the most helpful case to read when you're thinking about non-contractual quantum merits is not the English case of Taylor and Motability Finance, which has a discussion of the interrelation of these, but it's briefly reasoned by Mr. Justice Cook. Man and Patterson Contractors is a decision of the High Court of Australia, which is very well worth reading. And my guess is that it's not massively read here, or not widely read here, because it's a High Court of Australia. But it is the best reasoned, or the longest reasoned anyway, case on the topic that I'm aware of. So the facts. Claimant agrees to build two houses for $970,000. Payment is in stages. And before completion, the defendant repudiates, the claimant accepts the repudiation. You can probably guess what the claimant wants to do. They say, the value of the work I've done for you is more than 970,000 pounds, so I want a non-contractual quantum merit for the value of the work. Answer, well, it depends. The High Court of Australia is unanimous that where the debt is accrued, so suppose that the houses are built, the agreed sum is earned, the claimant's limited to the agreed sum, the 970,000. What though if they have not accrued the agreed sum? There's a split. 
The minority, with the Chief Justice and also Justices Bell and Keane, say that there is never a claim in unjust enrichment, or as you might say, a non-contractual quantum merit, for the work done. The plurality says sometimes there is. That in itself is, I suppose, not completely helpful, although it is worth saying, it's worth reading to see the kind of the different views that you get and the different analyses you get uh, within all of those three possibilities, because I think it gives you, in a sense, the range of things you can uh, think, other than always, but I don't think anyone would think you can always get the non-contractual claim. A few ways of, or a few questions arising out of that. Is there, a, or should there be, a difference between the quantum merit and the money hadn't received claim? Flip the facts around. Suppose someone had paid $900,000 for the house to be built, and then the defendant does no work at all. They just walk off site. Claimant then says, I want the £900,000 back. Defendant answers, hold on, you overpaid. Those houses were only going to be worth £400,000, so you should only get the difference in value between what you were promised and what you received, and that's £400,000. Why should you get £900,000? That's just the same question as the quantum merit claim arising in man and Patterson, although they're quite rarely juxtaposed in that way. There has to be an answer that is, in principle, the same for both, although it may have different answers depending on what the principle is, I think. But those cases were not put together by the High Court of Australia. They didn't consider the prepayment cases, which, going back a long way, it's clear you can recover the full money that you paid. There's a case called Giles and Edwards, which is in 1797 that says that very clearly, and it was said uh, by Mr. Justice Cook in Taylor and Motability Finance as well that you can. He, though, does not consider, and other people don't consider, how that fits with the quantum merit claim. Think about the minority's view, which a lot of people are attracted to. They say you should never be allowed to sue an unjust enrichment where there is a contract. It's not clear to me how the minority think that that works with their own law in Australia. In Pavey and Matthews, which is the case that I cite there, although I'm helpfully without the full case name, it was held that you can bring a non-contractual quantum merit claim where the contract is unenforceable. But how can they think that, the, majority, the minority, if they think that there is never a claim for quantum merit where there is a contract? Because an unenforceable contract is still a contract. So if you think that you ought to be able to pursue a non-contractual claim when a contract is unenforceable, in an unenforceability case, I think that the minority's view ought to be ruled out as incoherent. For the, I'll come back to the English case in just one second. If you're thinking about the difference between Gate, Stephen Gagler and the plurality, then one of the things to think about is roughly whether you think there should ever be uh, an ability to recover more than the contract price. So Mr. Justice Gagler says no, but you are entitled to bring a non-contractual quantum merit. The reason why he says no is largely pragmatic reasons. Uh, he thinks that if you are allowed to do that, it might encourage contractors to underbid for goods because they think they can then later sue in a non-contractual claim. But there are also reasons of principle that I might come back to briefly why you might think that's the case. The plurality say you can sometimes get more than the contract price, but they don't tell you when, and they also don't, I think, give a single case in English or Australian legal history where they think that would have been justified. And I wonder about that just as a method of rule design. So clearly what the plurality thought was, it would be sensible to leave this open because you know there might be a case, never say never. But my own view about things like that is that you should never say, never say never, <laughs> because it means that people then litigate over whether theirs is that exceptional case. And if in 500 years of us thinking about this problem, they can't name a single case where it was justified, then the cost of litigating the rule, I think, are just not worth the possible justice that could be done in this possible exceptional case. In England, I think the leading case on this is not a quantum merit case, it's a money-hadn't-received case, if we're going to speak in forms of action. In Dargamo Holdings, the Court of Appeal considered a quite complicated case arising out of um, some business that went wrong in the Donbass. And the facts don't really matter. What matters is Lady Justice Carr's analysis, which is 
um, unanimous in the Court of Appeal. And she says there is a no unjust enrichment claim, so you can read for that there's no quantum merit claim, if there is, quote, no space for such a claim. I'm not 100% sure what that means. It's a metaphor, and so it's not cashed out in explicit terms. But I think what her ladyship means is that there's n you don't need to think there is a complete unjust enrichment claim, but then it's been trumped or excluded by a contract. You just need to ask whether there's an unjust enrichment claim. And it's very often the case that there won't be one even when you think that there might be. I'll try and explain why I think that's sensible in a second. So when she says there's, the only question is whether there's space for such a claim, all it's asking you to do is the analysis. Is a claim made out or not? The reason why I say that that can make sense, and I think can make sense of the difference between quantum merit and money had and received claims, is if you think of the cases as being ones of failure of consideration, that is that there is a performance rendered that might be a payment of money, it might be performance of services, in exchange for something, on condition of something, then you then have to ask whether the condition is met. If I agree to build houses for £900,000, the condition of me building the houses was I would be paid £900,000, or dollars if we're in Australia. And it can never be the case that that condition fails if I'm paid £900,000, even if I've not completely finished the houses. So even if I get halfway, if I'm paid £900,000, there is no longer a failure of consideration because the condition of my counterperformance has been met. Compare that, though, with a case where I was expecting something non-financial in exchange. If I paid £900,000 and expected a house to be built, if I only have half the house built, then there's no way that that condition can be met by the payment of money. And so the question, and the reason why people disagree about the quantum merit claims rather than the money hadn't received claims, is how much are you willing to liquidate performances, building houses, delivering goods, whatever it may be, into money obligations. And the more you think of these things just in money obligations, the less willing you will be to allow people to escape a bad bargain. But the more you think of them not as money obligations, but as separate performances, building a house, whatever it may be, you might be willing to say that the condition is not met, and therefore you should be entitled to the full value of your performance. So I think you kind of have to squint at it, but I think that's what Lady Justice Carr means. The leading case on, non -con on contractual quantum merits has not been decided yet, but is reserved before the Supreme Court. And I am going out on a limb here because it's not, the grounds of appeal did not say it was a non -contractual, that it was a contractual quantum merit claim, but I think it is, and my guess is that we'll get there at least by a majority, so we'll see. The facts of the case were the defendant agrees to pay 1.2 million pounds if, and then query, do they mean and only if, the claimant introduces a purchaser for the defendant's land who was willing to pay 6.5 million pounds. The claimant introduces a third party. The third party purchases the land for 6 million pounds. Now, for those of you who are still with me, that is less than 6.5 million pounds. So the defendant says, not paying. Our deal was I'd pay you if you met, got 6.5 million, and you didn't. The claimant is unsatisfied with this. They issue a claim, and his honor, Judge Pierce, says, that seems right. You said you'd pay if it's 6.5 million, and that wasn't what that wasn't what they ultimately paid. Court of Appeal, less convinced by this, uh, but they split on the reasons. So Lady Justice Asplin, who writes the leading decision, and Lord Justice Males, who agrees with her, say that there's a restitutionary claim, so a non-contractual quantum merit claim is available. Lord Justice Davis is not sold on that, but he's also not sold on the construction of the contract that led to that conclusion. So the construction of the contract that leads you to think about non-contractual quantum merits is you think that the deal was you could be paid 1.2 million if and only if they were introduced by six, uh, for 6.5 million pounds and not otherwise. Whereas he understands the contract as being, um, there was an if and, on, if and only if you'd be paid 1.2 million, but there was a more general agreement you would be paid if you introduce someone the reasonable value of your work. Now my bet, but this is only a bet, is that at least Lord Justice, uh, sorry, Lord Leggett and Lord Briggs will agree with that. And then I only need to peel off one of the other three. I'm not in this case, so this is just an outside observer. You only need to peel off one of the other three to get them to decide it as a contractual quantum merit. Lord Burroughs, I'm not sure. I think he might be with Lady Justice Asplin because, uh, well, for reasons that I think are interesting about why people always conflate these under the label of quantum merit and why that's unhelpful. 
you have to have a view about how wide you think the law of contract is and what it can and can't explain. Lord Burroughs thinks the law of contract can do less for you than Lord uh, Leggett and maybe Lord Briggs. If you think the law of contract can do left, you're less, you're driven to a non-contractual claim like Lord Burroughs is. If you think it can do more, then the contractual claim will fill in the gaps. But they're doing different things, and so it ought to be distinguished, I think, under different labels. So that's my bet. We'll see how they decide they're reserved. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't know about you, but whenever Frederick put those questions, um, I, 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 in my head, I was answering them, and I think I got them all wrong. Um, so in that last example, for example, um, is anybody arguing that Judge Pierce was right and that nothing was owed? Um, I think... This is on. I think that um, Lady Rose seems to be drawn to that view. There we are. In the minority, but intellectually, you know, respectable Lady Rose. <laughs> Thank you very much, Fred. Um, uh, our next speaker is Dr. Ronan Champion. Um, I I've known Ronan for a very long time. I've known him as an expert, as an arbitrator, as an adjudicator. Um, uh, uh, when I was given his CV to introduce him to you, I had no idea he did all these other things. So I had no idea he was a doctor. Although I don't think he's one of those doctors that you would go to if you weren't feeling well. Um, he. he teaches at a raft of universities, including this one. He's on a raft of professional councils, including um, um, the uh, RICS. Uh, and he has written an extremely good book, which I have actually dipped into and been referred to, Construction Contract Law and Management. Um, and he's going to speak to us about quantifying prolongation costs and um, I'm sure he'll be able to keep that topic exceedingly interesting. <laughs> thank, you, thank you very much. I only have four slides you'll be delighted to hear. Um, and I've, I've tried to think a little bit back and a little bit forward on a topic which could be ridiculously boring, but I think I've picked out two points that have changed relatively recently and are worth highlighting. I'll come to those in a minute. Um, of then and now I've, 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 is one way of looking at this for a minute. Um, of then and now, just focus on the left-hand side. Um, if we think back to uh, the 1980s, there was a JCT form. Um, it said a contractor might recover direct loss and expense. It was not defined. But those words basically meant the recovery of additional, of additional costs. And that, was, uh, and that reflected the law of damages. It was, it was, I'm tempted to say, that that easy. Um, FIDIC was similarly cost-based, and in practice, and in practice, that meant there was a long and forensic evaluation by some quantity surveyor somewhere. Um, I do recall one case involving a junior at Keating Chambers who was driven very mad very late into the night, and I now find he is about six feet away from me. Um, but we all got through it. So interestingly, one of, the, one of the changes I'm going to map is how we have a changed relationship between, on the one hand, um, think of that in terms of, of a lawyer-led common law type approach, and a different community, call them the construction management community or the construction professionals, who are, who are pulling in the other direction. So I've pointed here briefly to the adoption of the, the Hudson or the Emden formula as an, as an early part of, of that movement, which was essentially saying, is there a formulaic way we can calculate some of this money? Why? Because we don't want to bother with all of this really long forensic type evaluation. Swing forward to the present day, and it's interesting to compare to see where we are. Uh, 2016 forms, well interesting, the JCT forms are largely unchanged. One change they introduced was to allow this business of, you can agree in advance what the amount of the money might be, in the vague hope that people might, in some friendly way, agree all of the consequences. It hasn't really succeeded. NEC was a complete revolution. It was a complete revolution because um, of the wording used um, but because they defined what they meant, well, the, the recovery is based on what they call the additional defined cost plus, plus, plus the fee. 
So interestingly, they're trying to define things. And if you define it, it's taking away the scope for dispute. Equally, the whole question about how much and what was to be recovered was program-driven, and, uh, and, and, and there was a time bar provision as well. Um, that form was introduced right back in the, uh, whatever it was, um, 96 odd. I had a look the other day, I saw a paper written on that um, form, dated 1992 from the fifth conference here, written by Martin Barnes, where he describes the entire of what he called the new style contract. It was called in draft in those days, the new style contract. And he talks about, well, it's all about good project management. It wasn't. It had a secret agenda. And this secret agenda, now I now see working back through that, that early draft he had, was one of doing away with lawyers completely, cutting out, cutting out lawyers quite definitely, and deliberately developing a series of formulaic ways through it so that he, an engineer, or the engineers, or the project participants alone could tackle matters without having to involve lawyers. And we see that trend coming through, not so much in the 2016, uh, the 2017 FIDIC, but if you look at, give me a second. Um, if, you look at the, if you look at the 2017, sorry, the 2021 edition of the FIDIC Green Book, um, it introduced a new feature. And this, I think, is one of, the, one of the breakthroughs. The new feature they've introduced is a provision for what they call prolongation costs, but liquidated. So the idea is it's really easy for the parties to calculate. And um, in, one, in, in one change in the past how many number of years, one significant change is they actually produce some guidance notes. And the guidance notes are quite extensive. And on this particular provision, they say, and, and th there's a mathematical provision, um, and they say the mechanism has the merit of providing a quick remedy where a critical compensable delay eventuates, where the contractor will not have to prove or to substantiate subs uh, such loss. And, um, and, uh, and they say, and will not have to enter into possibly lengthy discussions about what is fair and reasonable, which could result in dispute and requiring expert evidence with all of the knock-on consequences that involves. They say they are deliberately trying to cut out that very type of dispute. Um, and the formula is quite, quite sophisticated. It's actually not new because the Irish introduced a similar type of vision in the public works forms about 10 years ago. What is new is that FIDIC have had the courage to publish it. And it's, for want of a better word, it's mandatory. So in terms of a real revolution, um, in, in, in this topic, that's my first one. And um, I can see that being significant. So if I tell you the way it works in crude terms is if you are in the middle of a project and it's delayed, the contractor will automatically recover um, the time-related costs based on an overhead assumed to be 25%. If you're earlier or later in the job, it's 12.5%. I'm tempted to say it's almost that easy. Um, but that is a million miles away from that battleground of working through contractors' accounts that we had 20 years ago. So I've noted here this, this trend toward prescription, formulae, um, liquidated amounts, avoiding detailed evaluation. And I think it reflects a wider theme that we see elsewhere um, of using indices, of using mechanisms. Um, and significantly, those recent changes are all led by the construction professional community, not lawyers. So there's a battle going on here between, if you like, two communities. Um, some, so, but, but so much for a formula, but there are many things it won't cope with. Um, so, so I'll just pick out one or two here. Um, one significant change we see nowadays is construction work being built off-site. And I just want to highlight the first point I've got here. What if part of a project is due to be manufactured off-site, but... Due to design delays, the production slot in the factory is lost. Liability for the entire schedule loss is potentially thrown up as a result of the, of the, of the design delay. Um, this happens frequently with timber-framed housing. And we're seeing this in, in rather more significant ways with a rather more significant increase 
of pre-manufacture. You only have to pause for a second and realize the formula that I just referred to in the Green Book can't begin to cope with this, unless it's recharacterized as being some sort of a disruption type problem. But it's a good example where, just where somebody comes up with a formula, it's not necessarily going to address every problem. And the reality is we're cast back into essentially looking at, at that from a, from a, from a, a common law type, uh, uh, n n type of, 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 of position. The other one I've quickly noted here is, say you've got a major project with multiple parts. Um, is, the, is the party that, del that delays a very minor part responsible for the delay to the entire project? So if, for example, you've got a bridge and there's a central pier and the central pier has a problem du during the work and there's a professional involved in, in, in resolving whatever problem it is, should the professional be responsible for the entire delay to the entire project? Um, that point is, is coming up again and again. And, um, you can see the question that comes up, particularly in a professional negligence context, is whether that style of, of loss, in other words, the delay to the entire project, whether that is the responsibility of, of say, that, say, that particular professional. Um, that, that sort of point has come up in the Achilles. Now, the Achilles was a, um, a shipping case um, involving charter port... Ch Charter number one followed by charter number two and the whole question about what is the impact on, of, 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 of the delay. Um, here, of course, we'd see it in the construction context um, with the question, when you enter into the contract, do you seriously think that was going to be the impact of the entire project? And we're already seeing this. If you look at um, the decision in OBS, um, Old Broad Street, um, this, point, this, this point emerged. Um, to what extent am I responsible for the entirety of the delay or just a part of it? Again, it's a point not resolved by a formula um, in a simple way. Um, so the formula are not going to be providing everybody an answer. So what conclusions can we draw? And I actually want to draw on one, one relating to the teaching of construction law. Um, one of the conclusions here is that Construction management itself is changing. There's less work being done on site and more being done in factories. And of course, our brains are not conditioned. As a, as a construction professional, we're not taught about how life works in factories. But having been involved in one housing case, the contractor had booked a two month slot once every four months. If you lose that two month slot, you've got major, major problems on the project. So for what, what was considered to be a minor delay, in, in providing design information had serious and profound consequences. Um, so so that's, that, 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 that's a significant change kicking through. Of the standard forms, yes, we're seeing more prescriptive type solutions being worked in, like the example in, in, in the Green Book, but yes, we do need to refer back to the common law based principles from time to time. And then look at the JCT forms, have they changed at all? No. So you have to wonder whether some of the forms are just not keeping up with those changing needs. I suspect not. Um, it equally begs the question, is there insufficient research into which of those types of express provisions are working or not working? So really interesting, that prolongation cost provision has been in use in Ireland for 10 years. It's not by accident that FIDIC picked up the point and ran with it. It's, 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 it's because they've seen the context in which it does and does not work. And I'm finally just going to reflect on construction law for a second. Construction forms themselves are much, much longer, way more complex. If, even just looking at that FIDIC Green Book, which was their short form of contract, it's got 25 pages of guidance at the back of it. Well, if it's that short, it shouldn't need guidance. But, but it goes to show how that complexity in our standard forms um, is very much with us. And in teaching of construction law, the needs are now split. The split between the practitioners looking for awareness and how contract administration works. So significantly, there's an increase in courses at that level. But I think there's equally a role for, a significant role for, the more advanced teaching, asking why are these provisions required? What is the common law problem they were trying to address in the first place? Do they successfully address it? And, and looking at those underlying policy considerations. Um, and perhaps on some of our courses, 
we are going to see a refresh of the different, the different curricula in different places. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ronan. A contract that comes with 25 pages of guidance notes doesn't seem to me to be a very sensible way forward. And you have to ask yourself, the parties really read them? Um, no. And it does tend to make disputes, can make disputes quite artificial, because people say, well, the parties must have had in mind this or that or the other. And of course, we all know the parties didn't have anything in mind because they didn't get beyond the first paragraph on the first page of the 25-page guidance notes. Anyway, um, our next speaker is Nicholas Gould. Um, Nicholas doesn't probably need much introduction to you because I know that he's a visiting professor here. Um, he's a solicitor, a solicitor advocate, he's a surveyor, he undertakes all manner of um, advocacy and advice work. I think in the dim and distant he once instructed me, which just shows A, how old he is and how his judgment is obviously poor. Um, he's also a past chairman of the Society of Construction Law, of which I'm now very proud to be the president. Um, and uh, Nicholas is going to talk about liquidated damages, this from a common law perspective. Thanks very much, Peter. I started with this slide to prove that I do wear a tie. Um, they're all looking so splendid here at the front. It's dressed down Friday. No, no tie today. Um, so before we dive into liquidated damages, I just can't help but pick up on, on the guidance notes. Um, it's an interesting topic, isn't it? Why write them? Um, just rely on the contract. I think it's dangerous to write a set of guidance notes about what you thought you'd put in the contract or hoped you'd put in the contract. Anyway, there we go. Um, so liquidated damages, then. It's one of those topics that um, you kind of hope you don't have to look into very much, I think. You, you know, if you're dealing with construction disputes, the typical things that you're dealing with are extensions of time, money claims and defects and so on. Sure enough, there's an argument about, about the amount of liquidated damages that might be paid in relation to a, a, a delay. But you do pause very carefully... Um, if you're thinking about challenging them. Um, and um, often an excited um, supply chain member, a contractor, will, will, will think, well, if we can challenge them as a penalty, then that gets rid of the problem, doesn't it? Well, probably not, because you'll be open possibly to general damages, and you get into a whole debate about what might happen next. But anyway, let's, let's have a look at some of the law, because there's been a few recent cases, and to put that in context, we're starting out here, here over 100 years ago, so two quite recent cases. Uh, and um, Dunlop and New Garage is all about the selling of tyres, and, and, and uh, New Garage had agreed they wouldn't sell tyres at under £5. I wish I could buy a tyre. Don't you now for £5? Wouldn't that be splendid? Um, and um, uh, in order to, to stop them doing this, there was a term in the contract which basically said that if they did uh, sell below a certain price, um, then and they'd be, £5 would be payable. So a tiny amount underneath the, the price, they'd be paying £5 liquidated damages. Um, and um, the um, House of Lords, as it was then, agreed that uh, this was perfectly fine and it wasn't a penalty. And, and here's the rules that, that, that come out of that case. So whether you've used the words penalty or liquidated damages doesn't, doesn't really matter. Uh, the court is going to consider whether the payment is really a penalty or, or, or an attempt to liquidate what the actual loss might be. Um, the essence of a penalty uh, is a payment of money stipulated I like that as a, as a terror, and we've already been trying to get away from Latin today, but there's a little bit. Uh, and um, the question of whether a sum stipulated is a penalty or otherwise depends on, depends on its drafting and the particular circumstances, and we're going to come back to that, that quite a bit. They developed some, some tests in that case, and, and, and these are the ones that we tend to see. The first three bullet points there, um, extravagant and unconscionable, unconscionable in amount, if the breach consists only in not paying a sum, and the sum is much greater uh, than the sum ought to have been, then it could be a penalty. There's a presumption that it's a penalty if it's a single lump sum uh, on the happening of an event, but then at the same time, it's no obstacle that it might be difficult to estimate the amount of loss. And of course, that's one of the great things about construction, um, is that it's quite difficult. To, 
to work out what the actual loss will be when you go beyond the date for completion, depending on the nature of the project and the client and how they funded it and all those sorts of things. Um, and, and, and if you were building a power station, for example, and you're the contractor, you'd probably be quite keen to have a liquidated damages amount. It's probably going to be a lot less than the actual loss, for example. A um, bit more debatable if you're looking at commercial developments. So um, the classic test then as applied, just, just looking at a few cases from then on, there's, there's Bramner and Ogden, and um, here we had um, £20 per week for each incomplete dwelling. There was 123 dwellings, but there was no sectional completion. There was no mechanics in the contract which allowed them to actually operate that provision, and, and so it was found to be uh, inoperable, uh, found to be a penalty. Phillips and Hong Kong, um, there's quite a nice debate in that case about the equitable origins uh, of this as a penalty. So here we are in 1993 wondering where on earth all this came from and having a debate about its, its history. Of course, this is the, 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 the heyday of the Hong, Hong Kong developments, isn't it? The, the, uh, this project was um, a package for about 50 million Hong Kong dollars out of a whole scheme of 650 million, um, and, and it was considerably late. Um, and so what they were hoping to do was um, simply uh, avoid the, the, the damages by saying it was a, a penalty. Um, and, and Lord Wolfe made the, the point there that um, uh, it, it's not ex ex extravagant, the amount, um, if you have a look at the range of figures that might have been considered. It doesn't need to be right. It just needs to be sort of generally in that area. And I think most of us were working um, or tend to work on the basis that probably if the assessment is somewhere around what the loss might be and not too much above it, then probably you're going to be fine. Jean Charm and Barnett, well, this was all about um, football um, kit and so on, and um, suddenly it's quite different to construction, but nonetheless interesting, because Barnett were here to pay £5 interest per week in the event of late payment, and that equated to 260% per annum. And the Court of Appeal decided that you know, the magnitude of that was such that it clearly was not a genuine pre-estimate and, and was un, unfo unenforceable. Sorry, just going back there to, to Alfred Macau point. Um, this one's an interesting case. Um, and um, because uh, uh, the, the, this was Rupert Jackson, he, he, he kind of reviewed... Uh, many cases and, and um, restated this, this classic statement from Dunlop, um, but found that only four cases cited resulted in the finding of a penalty, and one was the Gene Charm case. And, and if you look, actually, those cases where it's been found to be a penalty are quite substantially different to what the losses might have been. Five reasons um, were given for... Um, his um, decision in, in Tarbox, so that the, the loss there was 45,000, the claim was 45,000 pounds per week, and it amounted to over five million because it was a considerable delay. Um, there was no penalty in, in this case. But the five reasons were the, the gap between the range of possibilities and the actual loss was not wide enough to be characterizing it as, as a penalty, even though the figures were different. A genuine attempt had been made to try and work out what the loss might be. Um, the, um, uh, the judge was also um, quite predisposed to try and hold up the terms. So if it didn't quite make sense, you're going to try the best you could in order to uphold the terms and make the mechanics of it all work. And also there had been pre-contractual negotiations, so they'd actually debated the amount and kind of sort of accepted it um, as um, players with a fairly equal bargaining, with fairly equal bargaining power. So these are the cases that we've all had in our minds for a long time, and, and then quite recently, 2015, um, we have this case of, of Mac Desi, uh, and straight away it's interesting because it concerns a parking fine. Uh, and um, uh, what's that got to do with construction? Well, we're looking here at a predetermined amount. And also, it's quite close to our hearts because you have to think about those times on a Saturday when you're parking, uh, and you see that sign which says, if you, know, if you don't come back within a certain time, you might have to pay a particular amount. And you're not on the public highway, so you're not going to get one of those traffic wardens capturing you. You're going to get one of these private people coming along. Can they do it? Well, that argument aside, this concerned a parking fee of £85 for exceeding the two-hour maximum stay. And you can see straight away it brings up this whole argument that, that the parking eye wasn't really liable for any loss at all if you overstayed 
by a couple of hours because they were just managing the parking spaces. Um, and um, we have this new test, I think, that comes out of this case. In other words, were the liquidated damages out of all proportion to any legitimate interest? So we start with this, this, this new term, legitimate interest. And is the sum extravagant, exorbitant, or unconscionable? Um, and and um, they decided in the Supreme Court that uh, there were two main objectives really here of, the, of this charge. First of all was to manage efficiently the space that was available in the interest of the uh, retail outlets and the users, so nothing really particularly to do with, with parking eye, but the second was that there would be an income stream for parking eye who were to deliver this, this interest um, in, in terms of the retail outlet and the users, um, and, and um, concluded that uh, it wasn't extravagant or unconscionable um, and um, was not therefore a penalty. The, the, there's a second part also to that, 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 that case where they're looking at um, a commercial agreements are perhaps a bit closer to, to, to construction, although it relates to shareholder agreements. Um, and one of the clauses uh, in that agreement provided that um, if there was a default, then the um, shareholder would have to sell their shares, not at the current market value, but at a net, a net asset value. So not a fixed figure, a moving figure, but nonetheless different to, to what the, the actual cost of the shares might be. And again, they considered that and, and determined that there was a legitimate interest being justified in the whole nature of that agreement, and so it was held not to be a penalty. Um, we start to get this question about whether liquidated damages survive termination, and uh, in this case of, of, of Bester, it concerned a biomass energy plant. Various notices to correct had been issued um, relating to delays with with design and obtaining permits. Uh, eventually, there was an argument about uh, abandonment or termination of the works. Um, and um, the, the, there was a clause dealing with the actual net loss that was to be calculated um, after a, a termination. And it included an amount of 10% per annum, pro rata or part thereof, um, on the full amount of the contract price uh, in relation to compensation for capital used by the um, employer. Um, and this was said to be li full liability in relation to third-party claims that might be made. But in addition to this, the employer made a couple of other claims. One was something called the first spark discount, um, and that was where there was a period um, within which um, if the uh, contractor didn't, didn't achieve completion of this first uh, phase of works, then an amount would be paid, and that, that, that came to over 900,000. And then there was delay damages of about 500,000 up to the date of, of termination. There's quite a debate, really, about this, this first spark discount, uh, and um, it was described um, uh, as um, uh, running between 25th of, of March 2017, 30th of June 2017, the termination had occurred after that, the first spark had not been achieved. And clause 21 of the contract provided that if there were a termination, any accrued rights and obligations as at the date of termination would stand. And so on that basis, it was determined and decided that the first spark discount was not a penalty, could be claimed because it had been um, an accrued right before termination. So it wasn't necessarily carved out of the actual net loss, but it was an accrued right. And that seemed to be quite an interesting way to, to, to decide that. Um, we also have this question about whether liquidated damages can be claimed up to the date of termination, whether there's a termination, and they decided that, that, that you could in this case. Um, we have triple point sort of working its way through, for those of you that may have followed the triple point case, but we'll come back to that in a minute. In EcoWorld and Ballymore, there were three blocks, A, B, and C, and, and B and C was handed over uh, in uh, June 2018 as a result of partial um, possession. But the practical completion didn't take place until December, and the employer levied liquidated damages based on all of the LDs for the entire period, because there wasn't three sections, as you might initially have thought. There was no sectional completion. Um, uh, and um, the judge concluded that the ordinary natural meaning of the works was completion of everything, um, and actually, the liquidated damages was not unconscionable or extravagant, even though a large percentage of the development had been handed over. You might start to think, well, they've had the benefit of those blocks. But the question really that was being asked was, um, how, what, what is the loss of, of that whole funding, of the whole arrangement? 
Um, and, and it might be the case, that for the way the particular development has been set up, that actually the owner is running the full uh, value of their costs and the full value of their finance until everything is completed and done. Um, if you compare this to Bramall and Ogden a moment ago, it seems quite at odds, doesn't it? But, but there we are. So we're certainly moving into new territory, really, in terms of a more liberal approach to the application, I think, of, of liquidated damages. Mansion Place, the, this is really interesting, I suppose, because um, really what was happening there, there was a, an argument about delay, uh, how much the building contractor would claim for an extension of time and money, plus the LDs, um, and actually they did a deal uh, on the mobile phones whilst driving hands-free, I'm told, in the car, uh, and um, uh, it went off to adjudication, the adjudicator decided they had done a deal, didn't need to look at any of the intricacies of all of this, and it was just quite interesting to, to see that the judge was trying to, to work out what on earth had happened here, and came to the conclusion that they must have done a deal because it made a lot of sense. Um, but I think that just emphasises to me uh, how the industry works on these lower-value projects. You, you do get these... Uh, these um, uh, projects where, where deals are done are on the phone and you have one line emails and so on and so forth, often more difficult than the major projects sometimes. So triple point then, this went all the way to the Supreme Court, concern liquidated damages on, on termination. It's about a bespoke software um, um, contract uh, and um, there were, we were split into to, to two phases uh, and um, the, um, the first phase was completed um, late, but payment was made. And, and the second phase resulted in a repudiated breach and, and termination. Uh, and um, so we, we get into this situation of, of having a look at what happens at the point of termination and, and afterwards. And you, this case went back to the position of that you can claim liquidated damages up to the day of termination, and it's general damages afterwards. And I say it went back to that position because that was really the sort of orthodox point, orthodox approach that we all thought was right, but in the Court of Appeal it had gone off in a slightly different direction. Um, but nonetheless, um, it, it becomes fairly clear that, uh, you know, if you can operate those provisions up to the day of termination, then they stand, regardless of the uh, amount of work completed and the amount of work that's outstanding, and then we, we're, after that it, we're in the position of general, general damages. Buckingham Group and Peel is a little bit different because the, 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 um, the argument there was not really about whether it's a penalty. I think you could see that it was going to be difficult to argue that. So it was already about the drafting of the contract and um, the project concerned a, a corrugated cardboard um, manufacturing facility up in Ellesmere Port. Um, and, and if you looked at the contract you would see a specific date and a contract sum. And then if you turn to the schedule with a series of completion dates, um, it, it had different contract, a different contract sum and different amounts in relation to the um, particular damages that might arise into a, a series of, of milestones, but there wasn't that mechanism in the contract. So it was challenged for being void for uncertainty. Um, but the, the judge came to the conclusion there that... Um, uh, we shouldn't really go down this route uh, of being void for uncertainty if we can make sense of it. So the judge decided that although the date in the schedule was a month later than the date in the contract, that really just gave them a month window of no liquidated damages until they hit that point. Um, that the actual amounts written against the particular sections would be the amounts that would be totted up for the liquidated damages. Um, so sense was made of it, even, even though... Uh, it, it, there were plenty of arguments and reasons as to, as, as to why, um, if you applied a kind of a black letter approach, you couldn't really work out the mechanics. So I think we're certainly in the area now where um, uh, the court's very supportive of, of these liquidated damages provisions, despite the problems that you come across. Uh, and um, if uh, we just have a quick scoot through the conclusions here, the penalty rule is an old one, um, and what we have to kind of remember is that it really relates to the secondary obligations. So if you've got a primary obligation to finish on time, well, the penalty would be something that would be considered in relation to the liquidated damages that is a secondary obligation running from that. And you have to ask yourself, is it out of all proportion to a legitimate interest of the other party? I think that's what you're asking yourself now. Was the term negotiated? That's going to support um, that you need to make the provisions work. 
how about balance of power and legal representation? If you've got two big players and they're both legally represented, it's going to be very difficult to get out of it. And how difficult is it to calculate the loss suffered due to a breach of a primary obligation? And if it is quite difficult, well, that supports the idea that a fixed figure, no matter how much it might drift from a legitimate expectation, unless you're in the gene, gene charm territory, is going to be upheld. Are the liquidated da damages extravagant, exorbitant, or unconscionable? Um, and then finally, looking at clear drafting, will they be void for uncertainty? Seems very unlikely. I didn't talk about waiver and cap much along, along the way, but um, those are other things to think about. If there's a waiver clause which says that you've looked at the damages and you accept them as being a genuine pre-estimate, that's probably going to give us some difficulty. There isn't a clear case on that, but I'm sure that probably will, there will be one soon. And then just in relation to caps, you just have to look at how they're drafted. And some of these cases I've looked at today um, show that you um, might find yourself in a position where the whole cap includes the liquidated damages or it's carved out as its, as its own regime. So if there's a cap of liability for contractual losses, that might well be separate to a cap of liquidated damages. It's usually, depending on the drafting, seen to be um, uh, its own regime in relation to time and money. Anyway, thank you very much. That was all I had to say on the topic. Thank you. I, I should say that uh, the bullet points in, in Nicholas's, uh, Nicholas's uh, slides uh, showing the resulting triple point uh, um, in the Supreme Court, I'm about to say that's what I've always understood the law to be. And I think that uh, that is a case where the Court of Appeal has slightly um, gone off piste but uh, you'll be delighted to learn that I was not part of that constitution, so I can't be blamed. Um, I also think, uh, Nicholas, that eco-world is plainly right, and uh, if that's at odds with Bramall and Ogden, well, I'm not necessarily sure that's a surprise, because remembering back 40 years, I think John Up will also remember, we all thought Bramall and Ogden was wrong then. Uh, and if it's taken 40 years for that to be put right, well, so be it. Right, so um, our final speaker in this session is Anne Karen Grill. Um, Anne Karen is an advocate, an arbitrator, a mediator. She's also a lecturer at the University of Vienna, but she's much more important than anybody else sitting up here this morning because this year the European Commission, her, European Commission has selected her for her, their new pool of arbitrators to deal with bilateral disputes under EU trade agreements with third countries. So think about it, I assume that must mean us. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to be scared. <laughs> uh, I guess I can still say good morning, um, Mr. Chairman, colleagues. I'm more than delighted to be with you today on the occasion of this celebratory conference. What I have been able to follow this far has been very insightful. And I really want to thank Professor Nazzini and his excellent team um, for bringing me here, but also for the way they put together the program. Because what I need to confess is that if you're part of the international arbitration circus, you realize fairly quickly that conference topics are always about procedure. And that gets a little one-sided. So here, I am tasked to address substance. And that's exciting. So thanks for the opportunity. And I have to say, I found my, uh, find myself to be surrounded with people of very much substance. So I will do my best to entertain you. Um, so the matter is liquidated damages from a civil law perspective. And um, I have to start with a disappointment. Um, it's very difficult to come up with a consistent application of the concepts of liquidated damages clauses and contractual penalty clauses in civil law countries in the international marketplace. That's just a fact of life, I'm afraid. And to begin with, it should be interesting to note that the UN Convention on Contracts for the International Sale of Goods, the CISG, which has generally been a quite important tool in develop developing a more uniform approach to international sales law, 
the CISG does not regulate either liquidated damages or penalty clauses. So the fact that the convention leaves that open um, is that the drafters found it more reasonable to leave it up to regulation by domestic law. And there you go, we have a very diverging pool of jurisdictions and approaches in different legal systems. So um, one dilemma that can be identified as a reason for this um, uh, varying field, I should say, is that we have a severe confusion of terminology with regard to liquidated damages in Europe, in the continent, I should say. So when you look at civil codes and doctrine and jurisprudence, you find that both concepts are recognized and accepted and allowed, and the terms are used interchangeably. And that does not make it easy. Um, I can confirm this, especially for my dear home jurisdiction, Austria, where we have a total of three terms to describe the same thing. Penale, Vertragsstrafe, Konventionalstrafe. So for a student of law, each one of those must ring a bell for the same concept. Um, I want to refer also to the ancestral uniform rules to liquidated damages and penalty clauses. Um, which has addressed this problem of linguistic uh, unclarity by referring to both kinds of clauses as contract clauses for an agreed sum due upon failure of performance. A nice approach, I should say. Uh, anyways, according to those rules, an agreement between parties to a contract to pay a certain sum in the event of non-performance is generally allowed. Whether it is a penalty or a compensation does not matter. What's important is, is that the courts in the respective jurisdictions are allowed to reduce the penalty if it is substantially disproportionate to the actual loss. So one thing I guess that can be said with certainty is that in civil law countries, the attitude towards contractual penalties is quite different to that in common law countries. And that goes back to the old days of the Roman Empire. So ever since Roman law, penalty clauses have been enforceable in Europe. Um, and not only that, uh, we allowed any time, uh, any type, excuse me, of penalty contracted to by the parties without mitigation. And the Napoleonic Code, which serves as the basis for most uh, civil codes in Europe, allowed for penalties to encourage performance of contractual obligations. So what follows is that civil law countries traditionally did not make any distinction between the concept of liquidated damages clauses and penalty clauses. And liquidated damages clauses were used to estimate damages in case of non-performance based on the concept that there has been actual harm to the plaintiff. And penalty clauses, on the other hand, were used to establish a penalty to be paid in the case of non-performance with the intent to encourage performance. And this concept does not require any proof of any real damage. So it's two very different concepts. Um, perhaps now, a look back again, this time to the year 1971, would be instructive. This is the year of the reception of the resolution of the Council of Europe on penalty clauses. And this uh, resolution is instructive on this point as well, because it was issued with the aim of recommending a uniform application of penalty clauses in member states. And the re resolution also set out that any penalty amount agreed by the parties may be reduced by the courts if they are manifestly excessive and if part of the main contractual obligation has been performed. So very clear guidance there. And in the explanatory memorandum, so we also have something explanatory on the side in this case, the resolution provides 
a list of factors that are relevant in determining whether a penalty is manifestly excessive. And these include the following. A comparison of the pre-estimated damage and the actual harm. The legitimate interests of the parties, including non-pecuniary -pecuni interests of the promisee. And then we should look at, or judges should look at, the category of contract that they're dealing with and under what circumstances such contract was concluded, uh, with an emphasis even on the relative social and economic position of the parties. And then they should also look at whether this was a standard contract form and whether the breach was made in bad faith or in good faith, if you can do a breach in good faith. So, you see, we get a little guidance here from the Council of Europe. Uh, but jumping even further back in history, the real turning point, as it has been described, was really the adoption of the German Civil Code in 1900. And that is the point in time where we see a shift from the unlimited penalties of the Roman law to the now existing approach of allowing mitigation by the courts. So the German BGB distinguishes between liquidated damages, they call it Schadenspauschale, and contractual penalties, which is the Vertragsstrafe, which to my Austrian German mind sounds more familiar. And both types of clauses are allowed. And the difference between them is really only that the latter, the penalty clauses, can be mitigated by the courts if they are disproportionate or excessively high. So, looking at our German brothers and what they did for the field of liquidated damages in the 1900s, um, I looked up what's going on in different other jurisdictions in, 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 in continental Europe, and here it comes looking at the French colleague back there, she might be familiar. So the Code Civil um, includes references to uh, la clause pénale, a penalty clause, and dommage intérêt, liquidated damages. And the former may be reduced by a judge if part of the main contract has been fulfilled, and if the uh, penalty is manifestly excessive. And with regards to the liquidated damages option, they can also be adjusted, and here I feel this is a very French approach. They can be adjusted if they're obviously excessive or ridiculously low. So it goes both ways. Um, and that's not only the case for France, it's also the case in my country. Uh, with regard to Italy, and I'm looking to Professor Nazzini here, I understand that we have clausula penale and liquidazione convenzionale del danno. And they do not exist in the civil code. This is just a principle of doctrine that has been developed. And penalties are generally enforceable, but can be mitigated if manifestly excessive, um, and if, the part, if a part of the main contract obligation has been performed. And then maybe another example from continental Europe, Spain, because it's different there. Spain knows a clausula penal, and um, it can be reduced by a judge, again, if part of the main contract has been performed. But there is no provision per se as to the mitigation of the penalty because of excessiveness. And that makes Spain really one of very few countries that has not amended its civil code to allow a reduction of the penalty amount. And the list goes on and on, and it takes us even to remote places like China or Russia, which are also civil law countries, and also there, um, the mitigation of the penalty is allowed, and the standard is um, when the, the agreed amount is excessively higher than the loss or disproportionate with regard to the actual loss. So there we go. What can I say? I'm not an expert on those jurisdictions. I can just highlight the general principles, but 
I can talk a little bit about beautiful Austria, if you're interested. And in my country, what's really tricky about this subject is, is that we have a wonderful mashup of both concepts. So I referenced it before. We use different terminologies to mean exactly the same thing, and we don't distinguish between liquidated damages and penalty. So we have a provision in the Civil Code section uh, 1,336, to be exact, that is the legal basis for this concept. And we also have an Austrian standard, UNORM B211, that refers to the concept of liquidated damages. So you see uh, what we deal with in Austria is very much statutory law. Um, but it has been developed by the Austrian Supreme Court. And what I can share with you is just a very general concept of how we would approach um, liquidated damages. So, and we call them penalties, in fact. So the penalty serves multiple purposes. First of, it serves as a pressure point, very consciously so. So when agreeing on a penalty in the context of a construction contract, the contractor shall feel the pressure to deliver under the contract as agreed, i.e. in a timely manner and properly without defects to the construction. Another purpose of the penalty is to estimate a possible future damage. So the owner of the project, the employer, enjoys the benefit of not having to prove any actual damage um, after the fact. And um, according to leading doctrine in Austria even, uh, the owner of the project, the um, employer, doesn't have to prove the occurrence of any damage at all, since the penalty is also due in, in, in the case where there is no damage. Um, if the penalty is triggered, the employer is entitled to receive the payment without having to prove the damage. I think that's major in this context. In terms of preconditions, there are a few preconditions in the sense that the penalty is properly triggered and the penalty clause is enforceable. So first of all, there needs to be a valid agreement as regards the main obligation. So we need to have a working main contract. If the contract suffers from a defect or if it falls away, as we say, ex tunc, an example would be the avoidance of the contract on the ground of legal error, um, the penalty will also fall away. However, if one party steps away from the contract or the contract is consensually terminated even, the penalty clause remains unaffected and can be enforced. Another precondition under Austrian law for the enforcement of the penalty is a default on the part of the contractor. So it is established jurisdiction in Austria that the responsibility for the delay or the non-performance lies within the sphere of the contractor. So there's one benefit the contractor gets here. They can furnish proof that they were not at default. If they do not seize the opportunity, the court will assume that there was default. Um, the final precondition under Austrian law for the enforceability of a penalty clause is that there is causality of the contractor's conduct for the non-performance or the late performance of, of, of the obligation. As I mentioned before, the actual occurrence of an actual damage is not a precondition. So under what circumstances can the penalty fall away? or be mitigated, because this is also an option in my jurisdiction. So first of all, as I've already mentioned, we need to have a valid contract that underlies the penalty clause. Then um, the Austrian Supreme Court decided, and this is also standing jurisdiction in my country, um, that penalties will be considered contra bonus moris um, if they are excessive, i.e. when they are too high. And the test that is applied here is one of proportionality. And the relevant vantage point is not the contract value volume, but 
the value of the actual damage suffered. I think that's very important uh, to point out. So if there is an element of disproportionality, the penalty clause will be considered null and void. But only, and this is also interesting to note, only to the degree that it is considered disproportionate. So it does not fall away entirely, it's just that there is a correction of the amount towards what is reasonable or matches the real damage suffered. And then when looking at the disproportionality, what the Austrian courts are instructed to do is also to look at the positions the parties find themselves in. And um, the Austrian Supreme Court has held that disproportionality can also be a given when the penalty can lead to the economic downfall. I think it sounds much nicer in German, and I'm going to say it, wirtschaftliches um, Verderben. If this is, what would happen to the contractor if the penalty clause were uh, executed? So another element that courts look at also is, is whether the payment of the penalties would create a really disproportionate economic advantage to the project owner, to the employer. So you see there are um, some elements involved here in the um, mitigation efforts of the courts that are not merely looking at figures or damage amounts. Um, the underlying principle of the mitigation efforts of the courts is the principle of equity. And some reference criteria that I should also point out is evidently the actual damage suffered, the degree of the default of the contractor, and as mentioned before, the economic circumstances of the contra uh, contractor. Another thing that I want to repeat is, is that the mitigation can go two ways also in Austria. So basically, if the penalty is disproportionately low, the courts can elevate whatever the parties have agreed and vice versa. The only golden rule is, is that the courts cannot go below what is the actual damage suffered. So there can be no detriment from the mitigation efforts of the courts. Um, the mitigation very clearly hinges on um, a um, evaluation of the circumstances of the individual case. And what I should also note, and this is now a little bit of procedure at least, um, the courts do not act sua sponte when it comes to mitigation efforts. That means if you want the court to interfere as a party, you need to object to the penalty claim, either by raising the contra bonus moris defense or by objecting to the owner's penalty claim in its entirety. So um, that would be it. For Austria, maybe as an aside, to make it, make it even more complex, um, we like complexity apparently, um, there's also an option, and this is perfectly allowed, uh, for parties to agree on a penalty that is independent of any element of default. So here, the contractor does not get the benefit of disproving its liability. Um, the only thing that will have to be shown is, is that the circumstances were such that the, um, the, the, the element, the occurrence that caused the late or non-performance uh, fell squarely within the sphere of the contractor. And as if it could be any, anyhow different, the burden of proof is upon the employer in this scenario. I come to my conclusion. I hope I have not confused the English audience to a degree where they're like, oh my God, we stay on the island. We'll never deal with uh, Europeans anymore. Um, it sounds complicated. In fact, it is not. And anything goes is the rule in continental Europe. Um, everything is allowed. Uh, the real difficulty is really um, how the court will look at the penalty and how it will conduct its um, exercise of mitigation. Um, and that 
leads to an outcome where um, there is significantly more discretion involved in the exercise in continental Europe as opposed to England and Wales. And um, what can I say? Uh, I look forward to our exchanges afterwards and I want to thank you again for your attention. Thank you very much. I think I can speak on behalf of us all by saying I, we're, we're not confused. I think we would think that uh, substantially disproportionate was a, a test that uh, makes a lot of sense. I think we might rebel at a test of ridiculously excessive, which, uh, as I understand it, is the French test. Um, uh, I was thinking that that was the sort of test that if you read the clause and you went, ooh la la, <laughs> then, then it was a penalty. Um, now, we're going to deal with um, uh, questions, but uh, happily for me, uh, Professor Nazini is going to deal with that because we might have some questions online, which he has in front of him. So Absolutely. Um, he, will, he will control your questions for any of these four, uh, and obviously not for me. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, thank you. Thank you very much, Sir Pizza. So, I, first of all, I'd like to congratulate the panel. I think you are... The first panel, certainly a, a, a disconstruction law conference, not to in, have incurred in any delay. So, um, uh, 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 very many, <laughs> uh, very many congratulations on uh, on that uh, to to the chair, obviously to Sir Peter and all the speakers. Um, we have indeed, because of that, a little bit of time for questions. I mean, just a comment from myself. I mean, from and also. You know, thinking back to my Italian legal education and, and training to 22 years ago. I mean, I mean one, one thing that always strikes me about the way that uh, under Italian law, and as I understand it, under Austrian law, I studied in Austria, actually, as an Erasmus student, um, which was, however, before Austria joined the European Union, so it was under one of the pre-accession agreements <laughs> um, quite, quite a while ago. But one, one thing that strikes me about the way many civil law systems deal with penalties, which is giving the court or the arbitrators, indeed, the power to adjust based on the actual harm, the actual damages, and so on and so forth. What's the point of the penalty clause then if you, you go on and litigate based on what the harm is, what the damage is, what the loss was, and, and, and so on and so forth? Um, I mean, in, in English law uh, has a test which it at least tries to avoid really going into a full litigation of, of, of all these issues. Um, and, you know, as Ronan also said in relation to prolongation costs, I mean, the, the, the point of these formulas is to avoid exactly going into these types, uh, these types of, um, uh, of, of debate. But um, uh, any questions or comments, please? Microphone there, third, third row from the back. Sean Gibson Hanscom, thanks for an excellent presentation from all of the speakers this morning. Um, Nicholas Gould, you were touching on um, liquidated damages, and a lot of the um, examples you were given in the cases dealt with uh, liquidated damages for time, breaching time. Do you see more and more use of liquidated damages for failure? to perform, so for example, in um, power and process contracts, when output from, let's say, a, a waste to energy plant doesn't meet the requirements? Uh, yes, certainly performance-related liquidated damages are pretty common in the process industry. It's interesting, really, isn't it, that we've been very focused on liquidated damages in construction for delay, and that's been it. The process industry uses them for performance. But they, they could be used in other areas, too. And Ronan touched on this idea about maybe you could have a predetermined amount for the preliminary prolongation cost. Surprising that it's not been done before, really. But you could fix a lot, a lot more, I would imagine, and that might, that might reduce disputes, um, even if it seemed a little bit unfair, perhaps, in relation to the outcome. But if you knew you couldn't challenge it, and at least at the start, you'd know what you were getting into, wouldn't you? Anything, anybody else? Nazir. Good afternoon. Thank you very much, Nasir Khan and alumni of this amazing institution. Uh, thank you very much all. It's more of an observation um, on one of the comment raised, um, Ronan, especially during prolongation, about JCT forms falling behind and the quantification. I mean, the practice of quantification has been going on 
for ages now, especially on prelims on, on major institutions. The Royal Institute of British Architects uh, published their contract and law report a couple of months ago. JCT is a still the most used form in the UK, over 60%. And um, uh, the observation is, as, as you said, it's falling behind. It was still one of the first form to publish collaboration clauses, sustainability clauses, and still working through. So, so I wanted to know um, why you think that JCT is falling behind amongst other forms when it is still most widely used. And if it weren't for JCT, we wouldn't have all this amazing case law. Well, first, um, you need to be careful of any production which says the JCT is the leader if the production of the report came from a building-only constituent. If you look at the NBS survey, it will rapidly tell you about the growth of the NEC forms over the past few years. Um, and that, that provides a much more balanced view, I think, because it's got a wider research base. Um, and certainly you see how remarkably successful, against all the odds, the NEC has been. When the NEC came out, frankly, everybody hated it. The idea of it was hated, and yet it incorporated a number of ideas that were brilliant. I mean, the very simple one, and I went back to Martin Barnes' nice, um, um, paper that he delivered here in the fifth conference, and he had a throwaway line about, oh, the way we're going to assess variations is going to be the actual cost plus the fee. Nobody batted an eyelid, but the fee was designed to cover all of the head office overheads in any circumstances. And um, it, it was a remarkably simple yet very clever approach to dealing with something that had caused endless debate for years and years. So it's interesting how an outsider came up with a very simple idea that has been frankly remarkably successful. Um, I think so the criticism of the, of, of the JCT forms is um, perhaps a remarkable reluctance to look outside to see what others are doing, when actually quite a few others have been moving quite quickly in different directions, often experiment. Um, maybe any, any more questions? I, I have one up, Phil, Phil Britton there, and John Aff then. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Philip Britton, uh, Kings, as it were, once upon a time. Um, just a comment really uh, goes to Nick, which is, banging my residential construction drum briefly before this afternoon, it's worth remembering that one of the alternative arguments that led nowhere in MacDessie, or rather the parking eye, was the unfairness of the clause that was the penalty, as it were, as measured by fairness rules because it was a trader to consumer contract. And although as everybody knows, that is not the bread and butter of those who work in this room and make a, an appropriate living out of doing so, uh, and, and good for them. It is also worth constantly remembering, if we're in a business to consumer context, there is a whole set of fairness provisions, which are, as it were, overlay to an extent copy, but to an extent also are more extensive because they come pre-Brexit from the EU, um, than the sorts of common law and civil code provisions that we've talked about today. In other words, it's a very interesting semi-overlap, but it isn't a total congruence between one set of principles in any jurisdiction and, and those. That, that's my comment. Yeah, no, thank you. And I didn't, I didn't sort of focus on that too much because I was just interested in, in this idea that maybe you could have a figure with not much behind it that might be acceptable to protect legitimate interest. How far you could take that into construction with much larger figures remains to be seen, I think. John, the last yeah, question. Thanks, John Arf. Um, the, there are two related themes that have come up this morning. One is the reference to Martin Barnes, <laughs> who's a dear friend of many of us. And I'm sure it's true that in drafting the NEC, he intended to make it lawyer proof. So he didn't need lawyers. That's why he wrote it in such eccentric language. Uh, that's supposed to be the language to be understood by engineers. Um, so there's an attempt to exclude lawyers from uh, what goes on here. The, the other one is, is uh, the discussion about adjudication. And of course, the whole basis of adjudication was to invent a, a, a method of dispute resolution 
that was so fast that the lawyers would have no time to catch up with it, and it would all be done um, lawyer-free. Uh, does the panel think that's still a worthy objective, to get rid of lawyers? Um, perhaps, Sir Pisa, yes, you can start. <laughs> well, I would be tempted to answer that. Um, I, I think, as, a, as an ideal, yes. The problem is that the more people strive to keep out lawyers, the more points lawyers take about the resulting wording. So, in, in uh, um, take another uh, an example outside construction. Take, for example, firstly the the Wolf reforms of civil procedure, and then the subsequent Jackson reforms in relation to the costs of civil procedure. Those were designed to be clear, simple, and keep out lawyers. Um, you will receive every year your two volumes of the White Book, which contain those simple civil procedure rules, um, and you will sometimes receive with that a very fat paperback, which are the Jackson cost reforms with all the authorities. Um, and I'm afraid that um, the simpler we tried to keep some of the civil procedure rules so that they wouldn't attract lawyers, the more they have attracted lawyers. So qualified one-way cost shifting, about which I have an appeal again next week, that is three rules contains no more than about seven sentences. And the number of points that are taken by lawyers about those very simple rules are really quite extraordinary. So my answer would be, yes, it's a very good um, ideal, but you have to be very careful about what you wish for. Thank you, uh, Nick. Uh, just one, just picking up, John, on, on your point and, and you mentioning the JCT case law and this, this point here. Um, uh, I think, um, and actually some of the cases I've looked at show this, if you don't, if you keep the lawyers out right at the start, there's more chance you'll need them later and it will cost more. And I've been saying this for years, if you got them involved at the start for a smaller fee, you probably wouldn't need them later on. Um, thankfully, it falls on deaf ears and we're still very, very busy unravelling these, uh, these sort of contracts put together and cut and pasted and so on. And then in relation to NEC, um, we, we, just, we are constantly doing adjudications of all manner of values under NEC. And of course, they're never reported, so we end up sort of running the same arguments or different arguments about similar clauses, left, right, and centre. And it wouldn't be a bad thing at all to just have publicly produced adjudication decisions. At least you could look for consistency. They do this in Singapore, um, and I think it's very helpful to the community. So I think it's a missed opportunity, actually. Um, I agree with and, that, uh, and I've been pushing for that for years, and I keep coming up against people claiming confidentiality. That's the big problem. I would be very pleased to see adjudication law reports. Um, uh, and then it wouldn't just be the ones that go wrong, because those are the ones that get reported, because there's a dispute about enforcement. Uh, I would be very pleased to see adjudication law reports, but as I say, the problem that I've come up with uh, repeatedly is the parties, and sometimes the adjudicator, claiming confidentiality. In the vast majority of the respondents to our, um, uh, to our survey on adjudication, uh, to which we wrote the forward, uh, were indeed against publication. Um, although this may not be the last word, actually. So I think I, I totally agree that would be a very, very, very good idea. Ronan, you um, want... I'm, I'm, I'm currently involved in some litigation in Ireland, and you, you suddenly think I'm back, into, I'm back in the 16th century <laughs> in, in the sense of we forget how much we've moved in this past 25 years old, um, both in terms of the complexity of forms and our procedures, the, the, the huge shopping menu of procedures or alternatives we have for resolving disputes. But you, you, know, you would be very foolish to think you, you want to be able to exclude lawyers altogether because, and maybe one thing I found um, uh, th thinking about this morning was you're always going to have difficult or unusual or peculiar circumstances that are new problems coming along. And then it's important not only to be able to deal with them, but to be able to understand what all these words mean anyway. Thank you, Ronan. Annika, I know Frederick, a last comment from... I need to um, say something about mediation here. <laughs>
because I also work as a mediator, as has been mentioned, and most of the construction disputes I've been dealing with in the past two years actually came to me in the form of mediation. And that was very interesting for me to note. Um, they came to me because they expected an evaluative mediation style. I'm a lawyer by training, I can give the parties that. Um, but I have to say, and this goes to, are we getting rid of lawyers? Um, the parties that I worked with as a mediator were supported by legal counsel in the mediation, and they played along brilliantly. And they were really the supporters of the parties. They were not the drivers of the process, and the outcomes were excellent. They really confined themselves to making sure that the outcome, the mediation settlement, is an enforceable contract in the end. Uh, but the negotiation was really done by the parties. So if lawyers manage to you know, find their place in the different dispute resolution settings, I think they can be an added value. So I'm not all for getting rid of lawyers. Thank, Thank you. you. Frederick, do you have a last comment? I'm very against lawyers, so I'm going to say something else. Um, <laughs> par parking eye, I think, just must, is either wrong in its reasons or its result. Uh, and I wanted just to say why I think that. The, the rule that Lord Newberger and Assumption give in, in MacDessy and Parking Eye that can join cases is that it's a penalty if it's disproportionate to the interest in performance or some performance related um, interest, they say, interest in performance. But then their second interest for the car park, this evil car park in Parking Eye, is that it needs a revenue stream. But they only get the revenue stream in breach. That's not an interest in performance, that's an interest in breach. That, wrong, right? One or the other are correct, but it can't, they can't both be correct. And I don't know which we follow for the ratio, the reasons that they give or the ruling that they give, query. Um, but I think that's a thing of parking eye that interests and irritates me because I think it's wrong. And it shouldn't have been conjoined with this big share sale case because it meant that um, you got a bad decision on a, a consumer case. Thank you. Um, and I think that brings us to an end, uh, to the end of the panel and to our lunch. Uh, so thank you very much, Sir Peter, to all the panelists for this excellent... Well, that was